Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 16th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Can I remind everybody to switch off their mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? <clears throat> Agenda item one is Housing Scotland Bill. Today we continue stage two consideration of the Housing Scotland Bill. And I welcome Margaret Burgess, Minister for Housing and Welfare, and her officials. Can I remind members that the Minister's officials are here in a strictly supportive capacity and they cannot speak during proceedings or be questioned by members. Um, I hope everyone's got a copy of the Bill as introduced, the third Marshall List of Amendments and the third Grouping of Amendments. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak and move that amendment and speak to all other amendments in the group. I will then call the other members who have amendments in the group who should speak to their own and other amendments in the group but not move their own amendments at that point. Finally, the member who lodged the first amendment in that group will be asked to wind up the debate and press or withdraw their amendment. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should catch my eye in the usual way. If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, I must check whether any member objects to it being withdrawn. If any member objects, the committee immediately moves to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Any other MSP can move it, but I will not specifically invite other members to do so. If no one moves it, I will call the next amendment. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill, and so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate <coughs> point. So I call, uh, we, look, we look at section 72, tenement management schemes, and I call amendment 149 in the name of Sarah Boyack, um, grouped with amendments 153, 154, 150, 151, 7, 152 and 35. And Sarah, as I understand, Malcolm Chisholm isn't going to speak to his amendment, but you are. Okay. Thank you, Convener. i um, grateful to the opportunity to speak to my amendments, and um, I'm just going to run through them in the order that they're in the grouping. Um, as members will be aware, the issue of repairs to common property has caused considerable controversy in Edinburgh in the aftermath of the statutory repair scandal. Um, and I know I'm not alone in Edinburgh colleagues um, it's still receiving casework. So I think that this bill is the opportunity to um, mend some of the problems we've got and to learn from the experience um, from Edinburgh alongside Dave Stewart's bill, which I think is being discussed as we speak. Um, Section 72 is a welcome inclusion in the bill because it gives the local authority the power to pay and crucially recover a share of the scheme costs. And the inability to proceed with work due to an unwilling or unidentifiable owner has caused unacceptable delays to home repairs and is one of the reasons why constituents have continued to turn to the Council for intervention via the statutory notices route, even though we have provisions in a previous housing bill to enable majority decisions to be made under the use of tenement management schemes. Amendment 149 is, a, is more of a probing amendment um, to consider the apportionment of costs where a local authority uses this new power. Now, it's based on the approach um, that the City of Edinburgh District mm -hmm. Council Order Confirmation Act 1991 set out, which provides the basis of the Council's current statutory notice system. So I'm interested in the Minister's comments um, on this um, amendment that I'm laying. The reason I'm putting it in is that under the 91 Act, the Council can apportion the cost of statutory repair work on an equal share basis amongst donors. That doesn't prevent owners from pursuing their fellow owners through civil action where the amount paid doesn't reflect the situation set out in title deeds, but it's a, much, it's a, it's a simple way to process and administer um, the provisions from the Council's perspective, and it avoids them having to pay uh, costly legal expenses where an owner challenges the apportionment. And this amendment would allow alternative def determination methods where they're considerable considered reasonable. So, for example, if there's only one missing share, it would be very straightforward to determine the missing share as the remainder once all the other shares were paid according to the tenement management scheme. But in the event that a local authority steps in to pay for more than one owner's share, 
this amendment would allow the missing shares to be split evenly between those owners. And given that by virtue of the owners being liable for a missing share, they've been unwilling or unable to work with the other owners to get a constructive way forward, this amendment would allow a process that minimises the risk of expensive and protracted legal action that the councils would have to pay to determine the cost. <laughs> Amendments 1, 5, 3 and 4 seek to clarify the requirement that an owner be notified before a local authority steps in to pay a missing share. One of the scenarios that would allow the local authority to pay a missing share is if the owner can't be identified or found. And in such circumstances, it wouldn't be possible to notify the owner directly. So Amendment 154 would require the authority to publish notice of its intention to pay the missing share in two newspapers, including, if practical, a local newspaper. And to complete the circle, 153 makes it clear that it's only in circumstances where the identity of the owner is known that a local authority is, is required to notify that owner directly rather than advertising in the press. Um, the, the requirement to publish notification in the press where an owner cannot be identified has been used before, for example, in the Antisocial Behaviour Scotland, Scotland Act 2004. And during the process of drafting this amendment, it was noted that there's been a recent trend away from publishing notices due to falling circulations of newspapers. So if anyone has an alternative suggestion, I'd be willing to listen to that. But I think at the moment, um, my suggestion would be in newspapers because there's an understandable transparency that comes from that. Amendments 150 and 151, again, I see these as probing amendments, but I'm very concerned about the issues that they address. These would allow... Um, local authorities to pay a missing share to registered social landlords. Amendment 150 would enable Scottish ministers to make regulations to achieve this following a period of consultation to consider the issue. Such a power would only imply, uh, apply in cases where the RSL is owner of or responsible for maintenance of any part of a tenement building. And given that regulations would have the power to amend primary legislation, I've suggested that Amendment 151 would require any such regulations to apply the affirmative procedure. Now, these amendments follow on from the debate we had um, in response to Dave Stewart's bill, and they were, the issue was raised by the SFHA. And they said that, in general, housing associations undertake repairs with agreement from owners, but that they are, in some circumstances, required to pay the costs for people who are not prepared to pay up. And in some circumstances, they effectively bear the costs beyond what they should pay to ensure the safety and security of their assets. Civil remedies to cover such costs in these cases can be protracted and unsuccessful. Um, that's money that could otherwise be used in improving existing stock or going towards the, house, the, the issue of much needed new homes. Um, now, since evidence at the Dave Stewart stage one process, I've been made aware that in Edinburgh, there are currently 11 examples of housing associations taking properties out of their letting pools because they cannot carry out common repairs and those properties don't meet the standard that they are prepared to let houses with. Now, that's a lost income at the moment of around £40,000. It means that those properties are deteriorating. That's bad news for everybody else in the building. And it's leading to housing associations selling off properties where there's a minority ownership. Now, that's bad news because it's going to lead to less of a spread of tenancies throughout the city, and it's very bad for the income of housing associations. Um, Amendment 152 seeks to amend the recovery time for repayment charges where a local authority has paid a missing share. Now, this is similarities to the Amendment 7 in the name of Jim Eady, but it does go slightly further. The current provisions in the 2006 <coughs> Housing Act state that a repayment charge is recoverable over a period of 30 years. Um, but in the evidence from consideration of Dave Stewart's bill, there was a consensus that 30 years was too long a period of time for the recovery of such expenses. So my amendment doesn't take the uh, 30 annual instalments approach at all. It, it gives a different approach. It gives the local authority much greater flexibility in allowing recovery of instalments at a frequency and over such a time period not exceeding 30 years as determined reasonable in the circumstances. It also gives the ministers the option of producing guidance on the factors to be considered by the local authority in determining what would con constitute a reasonable frequency and period of recovery. Such guidance would be useful to ensure that repayment charges were being assessed in a consistent and a fair way across the country. Now, one of the reasons I was keen to delete the 30 years um, expectation is that in my experience, both as an owner and as a representative, 
um, houses need to be repaired and maintained on a much greater frequency than 30 years. And this goes actually to amendments that Jim Eady has prepared for um, the third part that we're looking at today, section three. Um, I actually think we need to create an expectation amongst owners that this is not a once in a lifetime activity, but you need to be repairing your properties on a more regular basis. And I think the amendments that I've put in will actually create more of that expectation. Um, if I can now move to Malcolm Chisholm's Amendment 35 um, about tenement management schemes, uh, one of the key benefits of the approach taken in seven, Section 72 of this bill is the ability for local authorities not just to pay for a missing share, but to be able to recover the cost from the relevant owner. Now, um, at the moment, local authorities' finances are being squeezed, but in principle, I think the certainty of being able to recover their costs for carrying out works that will benefit the owner of a property is a good one. And Malcolm's Amendment 35 seeks to minimise the risk of non-recovery even further, because this amendment will provide that a repayment charge issued in respect to the repair work would be secured by prior ranking over all other burdens on a property. That would mean that in the event of a property being sold, repayment of the charge would take precedent over all the other burdens, which would ensure full recovery of cost by the local authority. Um, thank you for having the opportunity to put forward the reasoning behind these amendments. I've taken a little bit more detail, convener, because they're not in the original bill, and I do think the detail is absolutely crucial, having experienced many, many problems with uh, the the statutory repairs process in Edinburgh and I particularly wanted to test out the different choices as to how the, reg the legislation could be framed. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. Jim, can I ask you to speak to your amendment number seven and the other amendments in the group, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. I welcome the opportunity to speak to amendment seven in my name. This is one of a number of amendments that I have tabled which arise from an extensive discussion which took place between uh, myself and elected representatives and officials of the City of Edinburgh Council. The purpose of this amendment is to facilitate the recovery of funds where a local authority covers the cost of a missing share for a common repair. Common repairs can be complex and pose a significant challenge for the City of Edinburgh due to a high percentage of older flats in mixed ownership. While the proposal to introduce chain changes that take the onus for debt recovery away from responsible owners who are willing to arrange and pay for repair and maintenance work is welcome, it is unlikely that local authorities will be unable to make use of the powers in their current form. The 30-year payment period for recovery of funds through repayment charges, as outlined in the Bill, is arguably excessive, and many local authorities will have limited resources to loan funds over such a long period. Local authorities cannot borrow for this expenditure without the express permission of Scottish ministers, as it would technically be revenue and not capital. Increasing flexibility over the repayment period will allow more local authorities to make use of the powers. This will help to facilitate more repair work and improve standards in the private sector. The current system does not take affordability into account. There is a set repayment period of 30 years, regardless of the amount owed or the financial circumstances of the owner. The proposed amendment would link a reduced payment period with a duty for local authorities to provide support through their scheme of assistance. This would address affordability issues through the provision of financial assistance or access to advice and information, depending on the circumstances of the case and the range of support available through the scheme of assistance. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak? It's over to you, Minister. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'll first address uh, Amendment 149. Amendment 149 seeks to have an owner's share of tenant management scheme, scheme costs calculated as a local authority thinks reasonable, but with a principle uh, favouring equal shares by owners. And I'm concerned that this amendment could act to weaken the tenant management scheme and that it lacks control to protect homeowners. The tenement management scheme is designed to be a process of voluntary agreement between owners based on clarity over costs and how these are shared. The amendment would provide for circumstances where shares could be altered potentially to the benefit of owners who have higher than average shares of the costs. This could result in some owners having an incentive to hold out for a local authority to intervene to reduce their costs, while other owners may resist a local authority intervention due to uncertainty as to how their share of the, share of the costs will be determined. And this would be a significant change to the existing arrangements under the Tenant Management Scheme that has not been subject to any consultation. 
and I don't think it appropriate to introduce this change at this point in the Bill's progress without first having considered the views of all local authorities and of owners. And therefore, I would invite Sarah Boyk to withdraw Amendment uh, 149 and, if not, to ask the committee to reject it. Amendments 153 and 154 both seek changes to notification of owners by local authorities where they, when they decide to cover a missing share. Section 30, 3, 30 para 3 of the Tenements Scotland Act 2004 already provides a procedure for service of a notice on a person who can't be identified or found. This involves delivery of a notice to the property. The approach provided for in the Bill is consistent with other notices under the 2004 Act. Requiring, requiring a notice to be advertised in the press would incur additional and unnecessary costs for a local authority. And I can see no reason to alter the current arrangements for one particular type of notice, nor do I see any advantage from the amendment to justify the additional costs it would cost, cause local authorities. For these reasons, the amendments are unnecessary. They might also, in some cases, because of the costs, deter local authorities from using the useful power we're giving them. And I would invite Sarah Boyack not to move these amendments, and if she does, would ask the committee to reject them. Amendments 150 and 151 would seek to introduce a regulation regulating making power which could enable registered social landlords to pay for a missing share and recover the cost using a repayment charge. I will already introduce in the bill discretionary powers for local authorities to step in and provide a missing share where a majority decision allows for work to go ahead and to recover using a repayment charge. I think it's right that local authorities, as the, strategic, as the strategic housing authorities, should have this role and debt recovery power. RSLs will be able to engage with a local authority if enforcement or assistance is needed in their area, and I would encourage them to do so. I would also want to be sure that the coverage of missing shares by RSLs did not incur, didn't occur at the expense of services for tenants, and the amendment doesn't provide these, these assurances. I'm also concerned that there has not been any consultation on these proposals. It's not appropriate to in introduce such a significant change without having first listened carefully to the views, in particular the views of lenders, since they could be adversely affected by the proposal. But I would also want to listen to the views of RSLs and the regulator, as some RSLs have constitutional arrangements that could prevent expenditure that was not expressly for the benefit of members. As I wouldn't currently support the introduction of discretionary powers for RSLs to provide a missing share and to recover through a repayment charge, I don't see the need to introduce a regulation making power in this regard at this time. The Scottish Government's proposed work and cross-tenure housing quality standards later this year will provide stakeholders with the opportunity to raise issues regarding housing quality. Contributions to the scope and design of a forum to discuss quality standards are currently being requested with a planned consultation to follow next year. And I would want to wait the outcome of this consultation before making any changes. And I would ask Sarah Boy not to move amendments 150 and 151 and would ask the committee not to support them. Amendments 7 and 152, and I understand why Jim Eady and Sarah Boy have proposed these amendments. And I know that they reflect in some ways the views of the committee in the stage one report. 30 years is excessively long for councils to recover their costs. And I appreciate the arguments in favour of a shorter period, but I'm concerned that these ignore the risks that a shorter period could pose to vulnerable homeowners, particularly those who are elderly, living in fixed incomes and only with modest savings. A repayment charge is a powerful debt recovery tool. It allows local authorities to convert a debt into a security without recourse to the courts and, importantly, without the consent of the owner of the property. That power needs to be balanced by safeguards for owners. As matters stand, the 30-year repayment period provides such a safeguard in practice. The amendments would give a very wide discretion to councils to recover potentially significant sums from owners through repayment charges over short periods of time without owner's consent. They would do so without a robust replacement safeguard for owners who might not be able to make such payments. And that's what worries me. Sarah Boyack's proposed guidance for councils, but I'm not convinced that substituting the 30-year protection period 
and replacing it with guidance offers robust compensatory protection against the risks to vulnerable owners. I'm clear that any change to local authorities' powers in this area would have to be accompanied by strong arrangements that ensure repayment charges are fair to owners, both in the amount of the charges and in the period over which they should be made. The proposed change refers to what the Council considers to be reasonable. For example, there's nothing about a Council coming to a view in reasonable that takes account of information on the financial and personal circumstances of affected property owners. There's a real risk, therefore, of a Council requiring payments at a level that the property owner can't afford. And that could be a real problem for many owners, a young family struggling with a mortgage or an elderly person living on a pension with modest savings. For such groups, the change proposed by the amendments could mean real hardship and distress. Further, the amendments do not include any specific right to appeal for an owner who may be subject to an unaffordable financial arrangement. And that's the type of major omission I'm concerned about if we make the change here, however well-intentioned. But turning to the issue of council recovery, of course, councils already have the option to renegotiate, to negotiate a shorter repayment period or seek full and immediate recovery through the courts. The existing 30-year repayment period is a backstop. Owners whose property is subject to a repayment charge can't generally sell the property or create any new borrowing over it without first repaying the council. And the average period between house sales is about seven years. So in practice, councils are, would be receiving repayment long before the 30-year period. A reduction in the repayment period doesn't necessarily make, make repayment more likely. There's no provision in the amendments that alters what happens for non-payment. If an owner doesn't pay, whatever the time scale, then the council can't seek to sell the property as a result of the charge. A council can only seek recovery as a civil debt. With a shorter period, there would be situations where a council will have to place another charge on the property to ensure it received payment with additional costs for the council and for the property owner. For all these reasons, I, ca I can't support the amendments and would ask the committee to reject them. Amendment 35, uh, in the name of Malcolm Chisholm, seeks to ensure that local authorities receive payments repayment before other registered charges on a property are paid. A repayment charge that has been registered by a local authority already has priority over all future burdens. It also has priority over nearly all existing burdens. The exception includes charges already registered by the local authority and a small number of other charges created by other public authorities. As a local authority is already entitled to receive repayment priority for charges, it has registered in nearly all cases. I don't see any reason to change the current position. And I would invite um, Malcolm Chisholm or Sarah Boyack and Malcolm Chisholm's behalf to withdraw that amendment and ask the committee to reject it. And finally, convener, I'm aware that I'm not supporting any of the amendments in this group, and I hope I've explained the reasons why. I understand that there are significant concerns, in, in particularly in Edinburgh City Council, regarding um, so, uh, the issues that's been raised by both Sarah Boyack and, and Jim Eady. And we recognise the, what's behind these amendments. But to allow, you know, if we were to, to change these, I do think it requires legislation and consultation. And officials, um, my officials, are more than willing to explore these issues with Edinburgh City Council uh, and discuss how they might address their concerns with any existing legislative framework. And if it's found that that's, that's not going to be possible, there are changes needed, then we want to do proper consultation and bring it back in, in other legislation. I'm not just discounting these out of hand. Absolutely recognise um, the, the reasons behind bringing these amendments, but at this stage in the bill, even at, at, at stage three, it would be something rushed through and wouldn't necessarily um, achieve what I think we're all looking for here. And, and, and for that reason, I would ask the committee not to support these amendments. Okay, thank you. Can I ask Sarah Boyack to wind up and press her withdrawal amendment? Yes, um, I'm very disappointed with the Minister's overall um, response because these are issues that have been raised through the consultation process for two proposed bills now. Um, these comments have come both from the um, suggestions in Dave Stewart's bill on dangerous and defective buildings about how we remedy 
uh, the problems of the operation of existing legislation and indeed for representations to this bill. And I, I think if we adopted that principle in general, it would lead us to um, a crazy situation where if something was not in a minister's original set of proposals in a bill, we wouldn't amend bills. It just takes out the whole purpose of having stage two and stage three. Otherwise, we just approve bills on block. So as a, a principle for not accepting these amendments, I find that an incredibly weak principle. Um, going through the responses um, in detail, there's no intention to weaken the tenement management scheme. And I think... Um, the amendment here is actually to try and address a problem that has been identified by the City Council. And it, um, we've got this legislation in front of us. This is the opportunity to get it right, rather than waiting for an unspecified piece of more legislation. And I think that is actually one of the problems we've got on housing legislation, because in, in this bill there are a variety of different pieces of housing legislation that are being amended and corrected to actually make them effective and useful. And as the Minister says, Jimmy D and myself have brought forward amendments on the basis of practical experience, representations from a variety of stakeholders. So I think just the principle of kicking everything into the long grass doesn't actually fix the problem that the interrelationship between different pieces of housing legislation developed at different times is in itself a problem. So for that reason, um, I'm not necessarily going to push all these amendments today to the vote, but I am going to bring them back at stage three because I'm going to have discussions with other colleagues about this because I don't think it's an acceptable point um, to reject these amendments on the basis that they were not consulted on. That's a, that's a poor approach to addressing legislation because I don't think the, the bill as currently formulated does the job which it needs to do. We know what doesn't work from existing housing legislation and some of the provisions in this bill will not actually help overcome those problems. Hence the representations we've had from the SFHA and from Edinburgh Council who have concerns about the way the bill is currently worded. It will not address the challenges that are there. Um, I particularly, if, if the Minister was prepared to have a meeting with myself and Jamidi between stage two and stage three, I certainly would be prepared not to push my amendments because I am not convinced that the detail of what she's told us today is correct in every respect. And I think there are gaps in her um, response to the detail of what we've suggested. Um, I particularly am concerned about the, the point about um, the fact that discretionary power is not currently used in terms of Amendment 150. Um, I think the point we have in 150 is about trying to address a problem um, that is a current problem. This is not a future problem. And this bill is the place to address the issue about social landlords who are currently walking away from mixed tenement buildings because they cannot, um, they cannot, they cannot be sure that they have properties that are capable of being let. That is a current problem. It's not something to be addressed in the future. So um, I don't know if the procedure of this convener, if the minister is prepared to have discussions between now and stage three. Um, I did say that some of these were um, testing amendments, probing amendments. If she's prepared to at least have the discussion with her, I'm not saying I have to agree with her in every respect, um, but I would, I would seek that discussion before we go to stage three. If she's just taking the view that because it wasn't in the bill as currently proposed, then we just dismiss all these amendments, then I will both push them today and come back at stage three, because I don't think, in terms of legislation in this parliament, that is a credible response to amendments that have been posed to problems that are existing and that this bill we, we perceive does not amend in the correct way. Thank you. Minister, do you want to come back in? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I mean, I, we have accepted a number of amendments at stage two, and we've also... Um, made a number of uh, government amendments after the, the discussions at stage one. Uh, but I, I'm certainly willing to, to meet with, with Sarah Boyack and Jim Eady, um prior to, to stage three. Um, we're not simply, it is not a case of dismissing them out of hand simply because there's not consultations. We want to ensure that any amendments actually do what they're intending to do. And we're not clear that that is the case. Are, are some are necessary, but I'm more than willing to meet with both Jamidi and Sarah Boyack um, to discuss their concerns. 
So Sarah, can I ask you whether you're going to press or withdraw your amendment? Um, the first set of amendments I proposed, a, let me get them in the right order here. So it's amendment 1498. Uh, 149, um, I do want to, um, 141, I'm not pushing at this point. Just, just can you just, just 149, just yep. tell me what you want to do with 149. I'm not pushing at this point. Okay, so that's not moved. Does any other member wish to move? Okay, so we move on to Amendment 153 um, in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 149. Sarah, do you want to move that one? I uh, not move at this stage. Does anyone else wish to move? Okay, I call Amendment 154 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 149. Sarah, what uh, Not move at this stage. Sorry? Move not, at this mo stage. not moved. Okay, anyone else wish to move? No. Um, I call Amendment 150 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 149. Sarah, do you want to move or not move that? 150. I, I do want to push that amendment. Okay. So the question is that Amendment 150 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We move to a division. So those in favour of Amendment 150, please show. Two, those against, please show. The amendment is not agreed by votes yes, no, yes, two, no, five. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, I call amendment 151 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 149. Sarah, to move or not move? Not moved. Does anyone else wish to move? I call amendment seven in the name of Jim Eady, already debated with amendment 149. Jim, to move or not move? Uh, not move. Can I just see if... I want by way of response to the Minister. Uh, can I just say that I'm grateful uh, for the Minister's response, in particular um, her recognition that the, the amendment tabled by myself today uh, reflects the views of the committee at stage one. Um, but I particularly welcome her statement that she is not discounting this amendment or any of the other amendments in the group out of hand and that she is willing to instruct her officials to enter into a constructive and uh, meaningful dialogue uh, to see if a, a middle way can be found, um, particularly on Amendment 7. And I also recognise um, the statement that there is a need to, to strike a balance between the rights of councils to recover debts and the rights of owner-occupiers to repay their debt at an appropriate level over a reasonable time period. So I think that is a, an issue that does require further discussion and consultation, but I very much welcome um, the willingness to consult further on that and to engage in meaningful discussions on that issue. Yes, that's not moved. I call Amendment 152 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 149. Sarah, to move or not move 152? I, well, I would like to push this one because I have a strong view about the 30 years issue is not, it's not the right time, time level to be set. Okay. The question is that Amendment 152 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed, so we move to a division. Those in favour of Amendment 152, please show. Those against, please show. So the amendment is not agreed to because we have votes yes, two, no, five. Uh, so I call Amendment 135, which was in Malcolm Chisholm's name, already debated with <coughs> Amendment 149. Sarah, on his behalf, to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Okay, so the question then is that section 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Right. That is agreed. Um, we move to discharge of cost notices applying to owners of properties. I call Amendment 117 in the name of the Minister in a group on its own. Minister, can I ask you to move and speak to the amendment? Thank you. Um, this amendment proposes changes to the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003 and to the Tenement Scotland Act 2004 to aid the conveyancing process in particular situation. The situation arises where a notice of potential liability for costs under those acts is registered against a property. The effect of such a notice is that a new owner may become liable for any relevant costs occurred in relation to maintenance or other work. The notice of potential liability expires after three years unless it's renewed. 
An issue may arise when a homeowner wishes to sell their property during the three-year period or during a renewal period. Even if the outstanding amount is paid, the title will still show that the property is encumbered with a potential liability for costs, and naturally buyers may be wary of purchasing a property which is encumbered in this way. Currently, the keeper can deal with this administratively, but this may no, may no longer be possible with the commencement of the Land Registration etc. Scotland Act 2012. This change in the keeper's practice will not bring transactions to a halt, but it will mean more toing and froing between solicitors. In order to avoid such problems arising in conveyancing transactions, this amendment will provide for a statutory discharge procedure for homeowners. There will be no obligation to use to use use the new procedure and notices of potential liability will continue to expire at the end of three years unless renewed, as is currently laid down in legislation. And I move Amendment 117. Anyone else wish to speak? Okay, so we <coughs> move straight to the vote. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question then is that Section 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We now move to um, Home Maintenance Framework Duty in a Call Amendment 9 in the name of Jim Eady in a group of its own. Jim, can I ask you to move and speak to your amendment? Uh, thank you, Convener. I am pleased to, to move and speak to Amendment 9, the purpose of which requires owners to prepare a maintenance plan to cover common repairs with a view to encouraging responsible home ownership and the avoidance of emergency repairs. Sarah Boyack said earlier um, in our previous um, discussion that there is a need to create an expectation and a culture among homeowners that repairs are not a one-off um, event but are something that needs to be addressed throughout the lifetime uh, of someone's ownership of a property. I think this amendment uh, seeks to achieve that. 76% of all private homes in Edinburgh are in some form of disrepair. 38% of private homes in Edinburgh are considered to be in urgent disrepair. There is a clear need to encourage homeowners to invest in their homes in order to preserve the fabric of the city and to keep buildings safe. Proactive maintenance helps to prevent emergency repairs which can be costly and potentially pose a danger to residents and the general public. The requirement to establish a maintenance plan will encourage owners to work together and take responsibility for the maintenance of their homes, as well as marking a shift in culture from reactive repairs to proactive maintenance. This will also help to reinforce the message that homeowners have to take responsibility for the maintenance of their own home. It can be difficult for an owner to take the first step towards organising a common repair if they do not already know their neighbours. This can lead to small jobs being put off. Establishing a relationship with neighbours to agree a maintenance plan will make it easier for owners to organise repairs when it becomes evident that work needs to be carried out. Under this proposed amendment, local authorities would have to establish local enforcement policies, which could include a requirement for homeowners to, re to register details of their maintenance plan with the local authority or use of powers in the Housing Scotland Act 2006 to require homeowners to establish a maintenance plan. Okay, uh, Minister. Okay, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I thank Jim Eady for raising this issue today because it does give me an opportunity to set out some of the existing powers and duties in this area. There is already a general duty for owners to maintain any part of a tenement building which provides support or shelter to any other part under Section 8 of the Tenement Scotland Act 2004. Also, local authorities already have a discretionary power under Section 42 of the Housing Scotland Act 2006 to require property owners to draw up maintenance plans. These plans can already include common areas where there is evidence of disrepair or reason to believe an area will not be maintained to a reasonable standard. Historic Scotland are running a pilot voluntary building maintenance scheme in Stirling, and I will assess the results of the pilot and would want to be able to do that before considering introduction of any mandatory maintenance scheme. Amendment 9 would place additional costs on all owners of property with common areas, regardless of the state of repair of their property. Every owner would, would require to arrange annual inspections of roof areas that are jointly owned and appoint persons to implement maintenance plans. And I'm not convinced that such requirements are justified or that local authorities can't address the problems of poor maintenance where they exist using their existing powers. I hope um, that that explanation will allow Jim Eady to withdraw the amendment. Jim, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw? For oh, debate. So, sorry, 
Sorry, I did, you didn't catch my eye, Lily. Yes, okay. um, thank you very much, convener. Um, I think the, the minister's comments um, are quite illustrative because although there are existing powers and requirements, none of these are actually being implemented. And that does lead to a problem. And I think I have questions about how, if, how some of Jim Eadie's suggestions would actually work and how they would relate to the uh, tenement management scheme. Um, and I think if it was to be passed, Jim Eadie's amendment would have to be backed up by guidance from the Scottish Government as to how it was going to be implemented so that there would be a, a level playing field um, across the country. And I'm presuming um, that... Uh, Jimmy D would see a, a, a similar enforcement scheme as outlined by the City of Edinburgh Council in its submission at stage one of the bill. But I do think the, the idea that, that buildings don't need annual maintenance inspections um, doesn't meet reality. I think there's a, we have a real problem with buildings um, that need to be jointly maintained where there are no regular maintenance um, inspections carried out. And if there are powers that local authorities currently have, then they're certainly not being used. So I think this amendment puts this issue centre stage, and I think it's a very useful amendment um, to have on this bill. Mr. Do you wish to come back in? No, I think, I think we'd see this as one of the issues that we'd want to, if the powers are there, and that's one of the issues that officials would want to discuss with local authorities where there's a problem, uh, why they're not using the powers and how they can be uh, encouraged to use the powers that exist. So, Jim, can I ask you to wind up and yeah. please withdraw Th your amendment? Thank you, Convener. Uh, this uh, amendment has the support of the City of Edinburgh Council uh, and is designed to tackle an issue which they have um, identified as being one that requires to be addressed. Uh, I do appreciate the Minister's um, willingness to engage in dialogue with the City of Edinburgh Council, and for that reason I'm uh, content not to uh, push the amendment to the vote today and to withdraw Amendment 9. Does any other member object to this amendment being withdrawn? Okay, so the question is that section 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, move to maintenance plans areas, and I call amendment 56, which is in the name of James Kelly, but which Mark Griffin, Mark Griffin is going to move. It's on a group of its own. So, uh, Mark, can I ask you to move and speak to the amendment, please? Thank you, Convener. This amendment is to, to clarify the position regarding um, premises and gardens. Um, the, the wording of the legislation is, is premises, and we feel that that could be interpreted as simply the, the buildings. And this amendment ensures that shared gardens are covered in maintenance plans. The situation across Scotland is that there are uh, local authorities and registered social landlords who are having massive difficulties where they have tenants who share a garden um, with private tenants in, in these areas and maintain to, to an acceptable standard. Local authorities can step in if the situation in the garden breaches health and, health and safety standards, but this amendment would ensure that action can be taken before this point and ask committee members to support. Anyone else wish to speak? Uh, Minister? If I understand this amendment uh, correctly, it seeks to enable local authorities to require owners to prepare a maintenance plan for common garden areas. Local authorities can already require owners to prepare a maintenance plan, and this applies where the property consists of a single house or two or more houses, and the plan can include any part of the premises. A plan can already include a garden area at section 194 brackets one of the Housing Scotland Act 2006 says in terms that house includes any yard, garden, garage, outhouse or other area. The amendment is therefore not required to achieve its intended purpose and I would invite um, Mr Griffin to, to withdraw the amendment and ask the committee to reject it if he doesn't do so. Mark, can I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment please? Thank you, Convener. Thank the Minister for her comments too. I think the point that I made an opening this was to, to clarify the position of, that premises could be interpreted as simply the, the building and that we would want to make sure um, that gardens were, were included that to, to stop any interpretation simply focusing um, on the buildings itself and I would be pressing the amendment. The question is that amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
We are not agreed. We move to a division. Those in favour of Amendment 56, please show. Those against, please show. The vote is yes, two, no, five. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed to. So the question is that section 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed to those two sections. We move to charging orders, and I call amendment 118 in the name of the minister in a group of its own. Minister, to move and speak to your amendment. Okay, I'll speak to amendment uh, 118. This is a technical amendment to the Housing Scotland Act 1987. The bill provides an opportunity to tidy up Schedule 9 to the 1987 Act. Schedule 9 relates to recovery of expenses by charging order. Schedule 9 does, however, still contain references to few duties, and of course these are no longer appropriate, as feudal tenure and few duties were abolished by the abolition of feudal tenure, etc., Scotland Act 2000. The amendment therefore repeals these references in paragraphs 4bi of Schedule 9 and adjusts the references in paragraph 6 of that schedule. It also makes minor consequential changes to the Crofter Scotland Act 1993 and the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. This is a technical amendment to deal with outdated references to feudal tenure, so I don't intend to, to, to say much more on it. And I move the amendment 118. The other member wish to speak? So the question is that amendment 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We move to first tier tribunal and private rented housing panel disqualification from membership. I call the amendment 119 in the name of the minister grouped with amendment 120. Minister, can I ask you to move amendment 119 and speak to both amendments in the group, please? Okay, thank you, convener. Amendment 119 disqualified specified office holders from hearing cases transferred from the due restriction of the sheriff and letting agents redress cases as part of the first tier tribunal. Amendment 120 disqualifies the same office holders from being appointed as or remaining members of the private rented housing panel and, in consequence, the homeowner housing panel. These disqualif disqualifications will safeguard the independence of these tribunal jurisdictions and will prevent potential conflicts of interest. Similar to some other existing tribunals, these amendments also include the ability to amend the list of disqualified offices by secondary legislation. Having the power to amend the list will provide the flexibility to consider op operational implications more fully when more is known about the organisational structure of the first tier tribunal, which will include all of these housing related jurisdictions. I move amendment 119 and ask the committee uh, to support it. The question is that amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 120 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 119. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 120 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We move to Scottish Housing Regulator Transfer of Assets following inquiries. I call Amendment 121 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments 122, 123 and 124. Minister, to move amendment 121 and speak to the other amendments in the group, please. OK, I will speak to, to all amendments in this group, all, all of which relate to section 79 of the bill. The purpose of section 79 of the bill is to protect the tenants and indeed lenders of registered social landlords by enabling the regulator to act quickly in the event of an RSL suddenly be, being in imminent danger of becoming insolvent. As I said when I gave evidence to the committee at stage one, the risk of this happening is very low and the regulator works hard to avoid such eventualities arising. Section 79 is therefore a precautionary measure which the government hopes will never need to be used. It identifies four tests that need to be met before the regulator can set aside the usual requirement for it to consult the tenants and lenders of an RSL before directing a transfer of the RSL's assets. The four tests are the RSL's viability is in jeopardy for financial reasons. There's a risk of someone taking steps to have the RSL declared insolvent. 
a direction to transfer assets would substantially reduce the likelihood of someone taking steps to have the RSL declared insolvent, and there is ins insufficient time for the regulator to consult tenants and lenders before making a direction. Unless all four tests are met, the normal duty on the regulator at section 767 of the 2010 Housing Act to consult tenants and lenders before directing a transfer of assets remains in force. Amendment 121 and 122, which is consequential on it, provide that the regulator must consider separately whether there is time to consult tenants and lenders. They recognise that more time would be needed to consult tenants than, than lenders in practice. It would invariably take several weeks to conduct a genuine consultation with tenants, whereas a consultation with lenders could be consulted in less time. The amendments would ensure that Section 79 sets aside the duty to consult only where there was real lack of time, and I invite the committee to support them. Turning to Amendment 123 that addresses the Committee's recommendation in its Stage 1 report that the Government should issue guidance on how the regulator will act under Section 79. The Government agrees in principle with that recommendation. However, the 2010 Housing Act prohibits Ministers from directing or otherwise seeking to control how the regulator performs its statutory functions. For that reason, it wouldn't be right for Ministers to issue the guidance that the Committee has in mind. Instead, the regulator itself should be required to do so, and that's what Amendment 123 achieves. It requires the regulator to describe the sort of circumstances in which it would not be able to consult tenants and or lenders, what it would do in such circumstances, and how it would communicate with those affected by a decision not to consult. It also requires the regulator to consult with the representatives of tenants, landlords and lenders before issuing this guidance. I hope that the amendment addresses the concerns behind the committee's recommendation and that the committee will support it. Finally, in this group, Amendment 124 requires the regulator to obtain an independent valuation before directing an RSL to transfer some of its assets and to have regard to the valuation, the valuation when directing the transfer. This is the effect of reinstating the 2010 Act requirement to obtain a valuation, which paragraph B of section 79 would have removed. The Council of Mortgage Lenders argued that such a duty is necessary and should be retained, and the Government has been persuaded by that argument, which is why we have brought forward this amendment. However, the amendment does make one change to the approach taken in the 2010 Act. At present, the 2010 Act requires that where the regulator has obtained an independent valuation, it should then direct the transfer of assets at a price that it considers would be fetched if they were to be sold by a willing seller to a willing buyer. In practice, the need for the regulator to direct the transfer of assets is likely to arise in circumstances where the transfer is necessary to avoid the transferring RSL becoming insolvent. In such circumstances, neither the selling RSL or the purchasing RSL are likely to be entirely willing in the sense that we would normally use in that concept. Amendment 124 recognises this by replacing the willing seller and buyer test with a duty on the regulator to have regard to the valuation that, that it has been required to obtain. I think that's a more sensible approach which avoids the risk of the regulator having to set a price that is not realistic in the circumstances in which a transfer is having to be made. I hope the committee will agree with the approach and will support the amendment. Convener, I move Amendment 121 and invite the committee to support the other amendments in the group. Anyone else wish to speak? No, so the question is that Amendment 121 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, I call Amendments 122, 123 and 124 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 122 to 124 on block. Moved. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put to, on those amendments? Okay, so the question is that Amendments 122 to 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The question is that Section 79 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
I call amendment, we move to registered social landlord disposals and restructuring. I call amendment 155 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendment 129. Minister, to move amendment 155 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you. Uh, the amendments in this group give effect to the government's commitment to require tenants to be balloted before their registered social landlord becomes a subsidiary or part of a group structure of another body. When I gave evidence to the committee on the 12th of March, I explained that the government was sympathetic to the argument from the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations that RSLs becoming subsidiaries or part of group structures lost control over their affairs in the same way as RSL that transfer their assets to other RSLs. I explained that we would consult on proposals to give tenants the same right to be balloted when group structures and subsidiaries are being proposed as they already enjoy when a transfer is proposed. We consulted stakeholders between the 12th of March and 9th of April, and the majority of those who responded supported the proposal, and I confirmed in the Stage 1 debate that we'd be bringing forward Stage 2 amendments to give effect to it. Amendment 155 delivers the policy objective. It takes the requirements in the 2010 Housing Act for a ballot where a transfer is proposed and replicates them for cases where there is a proposal for an RSL to become a subsidiary or part of a group structure of another RSL. In this way, it treats the two types of change in the same way, recognising that both involve an RSL losing control over its affairs and that tenants should be consulted before either change happens. The amendment highlights the government's commitment to ensuring that tenants are consulted about changes that would have major implications for them before they happen. Amendment 129 is technical and has no legal effect. It simply tidies up a reference which is already in a section of the 2010 Act as it currently stands. And I hope that the committee will support these amendments. I move amendment 155. Does anyone else wish to make any comment? Okay, so the question is that amendment 155 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question then is that sections 80 and 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 57 in the name of Alec Johnson, already debated with amendment 51, which was on day one. <coughs> Alec, can I ask you to move or not move? Which number was that? Fifth, 50, not moved. 57. Not moved. Okay. Um, so I call Amendment 37 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with Amendment 33 on day one. Does anyone wish to move that amendment? Okay. The question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour of Amendment 37, please show. Those against, please show. The vote is yes, two, no, five, so the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 38 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with Amendment 34 on day one. Does anyone wish to move? Yes. Mark moves Amendment 38. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Will be a division. Those in favour of Amendment 38, please show. Those against, please show. The result of the vote is yes, two, five, no. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 58, which was in the name of Drew Smith, already debated with Amendment 55 on day one. Does anyone wish to move? Yeah. Moved by Mark Griffin. The question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to division. Those in favour of Amendment 58, please show. Those against, please show. <laughs> the result of the division is yes, two, no, five. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed to. I call amendment 126 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 76, which was on day two. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 127 which was in the name of Patrick Harvey, already debated with Amendment 76 on day two. Does anyone wish to move? No. Nope. Call Amendment 128 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 85 on day two. Minister, to move formally. 
question is that Amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. We are agreed. The question then is that Section 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. And then the question is that Sections 83 and 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, and I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 50, which was on day one. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is then that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. I call Amendment 40 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 50. Also on day one, Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 41 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 6, also on Day 1, Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call now Amendment 129 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 155, Minister, to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question then is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 42 in the name of Alec Johnson, already debated with Amendment 12 on Day 1. Um, group 1. Can I <laughs> Not moved. <laughs> can I, wait a minute. Can I point out that if Amendment 42 is agreed okay. to, uh, I cannot call Amendments 43 and 44 because... There are preemptions, so because I point out that amendments 43 and 44 are direct yeah. alternatives. So, Alec, not moved. Not moved. The question is then that um, call, amendment call amendment 43 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 12 on day one. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, not agreed. So we move to a division. Those in favour of Amendment 43, please show. Those against, please show. Abstentions? Okay, so the vote is yes, four, no, two, and one abstention. So the amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 12 on day one. Mary, to move or not move? Move question is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We move to a division. Those in favour of Amendment 44, please show. Those against, please show. Those abstaining. Oh, was that abstention? Against. Against. Okay, so the vote is yes, two, no, five, so the amendment is not agreed to. The question then is that Section 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. The question is that Section 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. That is agreed. And I call Amendment 45 in the name of Alec Johnson, already debated with Amendment 12 on Day 1. Alec, to move or not move? So the question then is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. That ends Stage 2 consideration of the Housing Scotland Bill. And I'll call for a short, a short break uh, before we move on to the rest of the agenda.
you just don't. So we move to agenda item two, public petitions. The second item of business today is to consider two public petitions. Petitions PE1425 on the adverse impact of DVLA local office closures and petition PE1481 on blacklisting in Scotland. Can I invite comments and views from, of, from members on petition PE1425, which is on the DVLA closures? Yes, Alec. I think, uh, convener, this is typical of the, the kind of uh, problem that arises with a whole series of government departments where the transformation from a paper-based uh, approach uh, to an electronic-based approach happens within government departments. The petition uh, particularly uh, makes reference to issues of economy, safety and customer service uh, to all Scottish residents. The, I'm afraid the, the issue of economy, uh, I'm afraid, is just a, a consequence of uh, this type of change. I'm, however, uh, more concerned about issues of safety and customer service. I'm not entirely sure uh, about the, the dangers that will be associated with this, but I'm, I'm concerned to know more about them. The issue of customer service relates specifically to the, the representations I've had from the motor trade, uh, and I, I may wish to find out more uh, about exactly what the impact on the motor trade would be of the closure of these offices. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Gordon. Could I, could I also um, agree with much of the comment Alec Johnson has made? Um, I know that in public transport, in order to get vehicles back on the road quickly, the, certainly the um, DVLA office in the Gale is used on a weekly basis by uh, many of the uh, public transport companies. And I, I think it would be an inconvenience to certainly the public transport operators if the uh, DVLA office at the Gale was to close. And I'm sure that would be replicated across the whole of Scotland. Anyone else? Can I just note the um, representations that were received from the PCS trade union who said that if implemented, the local office closures would have led to the loss of a total of 119 jobs in Scotland in five offices across the country. I think that's a significant point. I would say that that is a significant point and we never want to uh, see jobs being lost. But uh, what I referred to in my original remark was a, a change in the, the nature and the practice of government that's being driven by uh, technology. And it, it would be irresponsible of us, any politician uh, of any colour, to suggest that government should be kept as big as possible in order to employ as many people as possible. And we must always remember that efficiency in government drives economic growth and creates jobs. So that efficiency in government is something that we should, in principle, be supporting. I suspect because this is Westminster legislation, these people are not covered by no compulsory redundancies as they would be in the, under the Scottish Government. And it's also interesting to note in our paper, I think, that we did ask for um, comments and we asked the haulage and freight stakeholders on two occasions to express any concerns that they had and none have been received. Um, so we may want to point that out to the petitioner. Um, I don't know what do you recommend that we close the petition or any further action that the committee wishes to take? I think it would be reasonable uh, for us to uh, support the concept that the Scottish Government should make representations. I think from Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Public Petitions Committee would have done yeah. that when they were considering the petition. Well, we we'll, could write to them and tell them to support their actions. Sorry? could write to them and tell them to support their actions. Support the Public Petition Committee? That doesn't really... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Transport Scotland wrote to the committee... Uh, <coughs> detailing their response to the UK government consultation. So, I think all those steps have 
gone been gone through, if you like. I don't think I would uh, so more from Mr Johnson's suggestion that the Scottish Parliament should urge the Scottish Government to make representations to the UK Government, but it's just a question of clarifying whether that has been done by the Public Petitions Committee. It has, it has been done by the Government. If you look at paragraph 17, I think, if you read paragraph 17, uh, is it paragraph 17? Yeah. We have subsequently written and have details back. So a response was received from the Transport Strategy Unit of the Scottish Government on the 21st of January. when it said there are no plans to revisit the closures and that the transformation programme to reduce the DVLA's running cross costs will be, will be going ahead. That was the response that the Scottish Government must have got from the DVLA, or the Westminster Government. So, I think everything has been done, done that could well. be done by, during its passage through the Public Petitions Committee, if you like, before it was referred to us. Well, I think we should write to the petitioner uh, uh, to that effect and close the petition. Okay, is that agreed? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, uh, so we move on to um, comments. Does anyone have any comments or views on petition PE1481? <laughs> Mark? When we, we discussed the issue of blacklisting through the, the, the process of um, scrutiny the public um, procurement reform bill, um, but there still has been evidence of um, other, other agencies um, operating blacklists. Um, there have been motions tabled in the Parliament in the, in the last couple of weeks to that effect. Um, and it seems to me that there are still more, there's still more um, to be uncovered. And until agreement is reached with those who have previously been found to be operating blacklists and the, the members of staff who were discriminated against, I think until agreement on level of com compensation and, and other things that, that we should um, continue to keep this petition open. Yeah, I would remind you, though, it's specifically related to the awarded of public contracts. Yeah. So, you know, we can't get involved in terms of of companies that are involved, you know, working in the, purely in the private private sector. I would go so far as to say that we have been through uh, a long process uh, in relation to the procurement bill, which has now completed its passage, and the issue of. Uh, the use of the award of public contracts to influence uh, companies in this way uh, has been discussed both at stage one uh, and stage two. It uh, has been rejected for legitimate reasons uh, during its parliamentary process uh, and as a consequence I believe that matter has been addressed by Parliament as a whole. Gordon, did you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say that I'm totally against blacklisting. I know the Scottish Government's against blacklisting, but we've got a bit of a problem in the sense that most of this comes under UK employment law. It's reserved to the UK Government, unless, of course, we get a, a, a vote on the 18th of September that goes the right direction. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what we can do with, with this petition, bearing in mind that employment law is reserved. I mean, I know, my understanding is that the Scottish Government has... Um, written to a number of the unions asking them uh, to um, provide evidence to them in, in order for them to um, provide guidance, uh, future guidance for the procurement process. And I think that's probably the right way to go forward is to um, um, improve the guidance for the procurement process based on um, evidence that's received from the unions. And, you know, there doesn't seem to be uh, any evidence that any Scottish government contracts have uh, suffered from blacklisting? I agree. It, ha it has been linked to the public procurement mm -hmm. bill, but there is still an outstanding call for uh, the Scottish government to conduct a full independent public inquiry. And on the point, um, Gordon Norrell raises that 
Um, there's no evidence found that Scottish Government contracts have went to companies operating blacklists. The fact remains that there has been no independent inquiry to ascertain whether that um, has happened or not. What I, I could maybe suggest then is that we as a committee write to the petitioners and ask if they are satisfied with the actions in the government have been taken through the Public Procurement Reform Bill um, uh, and, and keep this petition open until we receive a response. Mm. Yeah. So you want to write to the petitioners to see if what the government has been do done so far is, in terms of public contracts, is enough. enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pointing out that it's, you know, a reserve employment law is a reserve matter. I mean, you know, if we could see what's the name of the company, the consulting association or they work they, cons they work under two names, don't they? Did I see? I mean, if they went out of business that would be fine, and especially in Scotland. But you know, as I say it's it's reserved, so they work work, work UK wide. Okay, but we can do as agreed. Okay, we move on now to then agenda item three, annual report. Um, can I invite comments from members on the annual report as drafted? It seems okay. However, I seem to have got somebody's copy with handwritten notes on it. <laughs> I don't know. It's not mine. Oops. <laughs> well, I bet I'd have done 34. Oh, there is. He's got an extra bag. I'm going to have to swap it. I just wondered, wondered if, we, um, if we wanted to maybe beef up the bit on um, the fact that we oh, went... Okay. <laughs> took part in the Parliament Day. I mean, I think that was very successful, both yeah. Yeah. as a committee and as, you know, given the fact that we were discussing the housing bill, we had an you know, important piece of legislation and, and going out oh, was... I highlighted my year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just if we beef that bit up a bit, so maybe? I remember that. Just clear it yeah, and so if we did that, and then I just cleared that bit. But Andy, got any other comments? No. no? Okay. Um, that concludes our business for today, and the committee will publish its report on the second of June, which is next week. Next week, the committee will consider consider an affirmative instrument on the HGV speed limit on the M9 A9 Trunk Road regulations 2000, uh, 2014. And I close the meeting.